Bueno, eh, vamos a empezar, vamos a retomar las sesiones eh, después del café. Eh, gracias a todos los que habéis subido a tiempo. Tenemos eh, ahora mismo, ya han subido ellos, ellos sin, sin tener yo que decirles nada, tenemos a Robin Titter, de, viene de, Cali, de California, de Oregón, bueno, California, pero trabaja en el estado de Oregón, y John Gastil, que va a ayudar a responder eh, preguntas, dado que él ha sido evaluador de, de los paneles ciudadanos de Oregón. Y bueno, quería introducir eh, un poco la sesión. No, Robin, ¿tú tienes cascos? Sí, mejor. Yo sé. Eh, antes habíamos hablado de que en Barcelona íbamos, eh, la conferencia de OIDP tiene que ver con iniciativas ciudadanas y con democracia directa. Eh, llevamos eh, unos, un par de paneles de, digamos, eh, democracia deliberativa. Hemos visto cómo se conecta un referéndum a través de una asamblea deliberativa, cómo puede luego ocurrir un referéndum, ¿no? Es decir, cómo los procesos están conectados. Esto es un proceso similar eh, que está conectado, es decir, cómo un panel ciudadano se conecta con una votación de referéndum. Entonces, eh, la explicó, eh, antes eh, lo explicó un poco Arancha. Eh, ¿Qué pasa cuando una persona va a votar en un referéndum y no sabe absolutamente nada de qué es lo que va a votar? Que eso es, lo hemos visto en algunos ejemplos de algunos referéndums que han ocurrido en el mundo. Entonces, digamos que esta iniciativa de Healthy Democracy, que, que lidera Robin desde hace años, lo que hace es insertar un componente deliberativo para que con la papeleta todos los votantes tengan información y además información neutral eh, elaborada por ciudadanos de manera eh, eh, independiente de gobiernos y de partidos políticos. ¿vale? Entonces, es el, el caso que vamos a estudiar y quiero invitar a Robin a, a que suba a, a contarlo. Thank you, Yago. Buenos días, everybody. Um, greetings from the United States, ground zero of what can happen to democracy if you're maybe not paying very much attention to it or not enough attention to the right parts of it. Um, it's a real honor to be here with you today and especially uh, a bonus that you get Dr. John Gastel, who is the primary researcher of the CIR over the last 10 years. I've only been associated with healthy democracy for about three years, so I want to give due credit to um, Ned Crosby and uh, Tyrone uh, Reitman and Elliot Shuford, who actually started the organization about 10 years ago and deliberated with Ned Crosby, who is um, one of the people who came up with the concept of the citizen jury model, um, of, on which the Citizens Initiative Review, or the CIR, is uh, modeled. Um, you've heard a lot about sortition already and its applications to various um, types of public policy questions. The CIR is specifically, as Yago mentioned, designed to uh, be a deliberative body on a by, um, um, on, on a question that's a yes or no question, right? So when, when, when Ned Crosby and some of the founders of Healthy Democracy were deliberating on how to um, bring the citizen jury into more applications in the United States in particular, they looked at the ballot initiative process because um, in Oregon, for example, Um, it was starting to take greater and greater um, space in the voters' pamphlet in terms of what voters were having to, to vote on. Um, Oregon adopted the Citizens' Initiative in 1902, so we have a long history in direct democracy in Oregon, and Oregon voters really do like the ballot initiative process. What they don't like is being asked to... to vote on public policy questions that they cannot hope to know good factual information about. And in fact, one of the polling questions um, that helped us decide the direction of healthy democracy was the fact that three quarters of the people polled said that they found ballot initiative questions very confusing and difficult to understand. And yet two thirds of those still voted on them, just doing the best they could based on the information that was available to them. Uh, it started in 2011 in Oregon, actually it started in 2010, it was piloted in the state of Oregon, and in 2011 the Oregon legislature actually 
um, passed the, the Citizens Initiative Review Commission into law, and the commission is the oversight body for the CIR in the state of Oregon. Um, much like you've heard today around other models, it convenes a cross-section of the, of the population, whether it's state or county or city. We've been doing state ballot initiatives mostly since 2010 um, that provides their fellow citizens with a trustworthy source of information on ballot initiatives. The process is very similar to what you've already heard. We, we send out um, sometimes a 10,000 piece mailing depending on the states. In Massachusetts, it was 15,000 pieces based on the response to that, which is anywhere between three and five percent. We randomly select the panelists that are demographically representative of the electorate. Um, and uh, we may also add um, to that various other characteristics based on the ballot initiative topic to be reviewed. Um, they come together for a period of now four days to, to study in depth the ballot initiative um, and to deliberate with one another and then come to uh, a, a shared understanding of what the most strong and reliable information about that ballot initiative is that they think it's important for their fellow voters to know. The voter outreach is, again, um, selected based on these characteristics, age, gender, uh, race and ethnicity, educational attainment, political party, and geography. So um, you have, again, a snapshot of the electorate in the state um, that you're reviewing the ballot initiative in. Um, I think one of the things that um, maybe it was Pablo mentioned, that voter support is very important in order to make this experience as accessible as possible to as wide a range of citizenry as, as possible. So they are provided with a stipend. In Oregon, it is equivalent to the daily wage of the average Oregonian, which is about $150 a day, $600 for the four days. Um, in addition to that, all of their travel is reimbursed. All of their accommodation and meals during the four days they're together is paid for. We also pay for childcare during the time away. And in this day and age, we also pay for elder care for those who are the primary caregivers for elderly parents um, and or children. What this does, it brings into the deliberative process citizens who often you do not find in other deliberative processes, um, young people, um, uh, pe communities of color, in, in the state of Oregon, for example, you have much more rural representation that you might otherwise as well. The four days consist of uh, a deep dive in the initiative itself, just the technical language of the initiative. Perhaps more importantly though, the panel talks in depth about how to assess what they call strong and reliable information. They come to an agreement on their own checklist of what is strong and reliable information that they can use going forward in the process of assessing the ballot measure um, information that comes in from the advocates, both pro and con. They, are, um, they have an opportunity to directly question the advocates, both pro and con, on the ballot initiative. And they also have testimony and ask questions from a range of independent experts. And I know there was a question here earlier about how those experts get um, selected, which is very important in order to have trust on both sides uh, of the issue in the independent experts. And then there's small and large group deliberation. Again, large group deliberation um, is, is important for the public to be able to see. Smaller group uh, deliberations are out of, uh, they're not out of, I, eye level, I mean, the, the public can see them, but they can't hear them deliberate in the small groups. So the only thing they can actually hear is the large group um, deliberations in terms of the public and the media. And then in Oregon, um, the findings get printed in the Oregon voters pamphlet. So that was part of the legislation that was passed by the Oregon legislature. And we have um, a prominent page, uh, page in the Oregon voters pamphlet right beyond the Secretary of State's um, summary statement, the financial impact statement, and then there's the citizen statement, which comes on its own before all of the, the pro and con um, 
um, shall I say propaganda? Yes, I will say propaganda. Um, this is a list of some of the public policy questions that have been reviewed by citizen panelists. And I will echo what everyone has already said up here so far, is that citizen panelists are up to this task. They can do this. They just need the proper um, invitation, the proper container, and time to, to do the study in depth. But they are up to the task. And um, Dr. Gasso will tell you a little bit more about um, that going forward. The impacts are dual, I would say, and they're both important, and, and some of the previous people have talked about this before. I think that it is very important, the impact that this has on the citizen panelists themselves in terms of reconnecting themselves with democracy as they thought it was supposed to be and can be, um, as well as the impact on, on strong, reliable, and factual voter information available to the larger electorate. But I do not want to underestimate the impact on those who show up as panelists and are invited into um, a truly democratic deliberative process. And this um, statement, we did not ask for this. this. This sort of came to us from the panel in Massachusetts following their 2016 review. And they felt this so strongly that they wanted to have this in the record in terms of the impact that they felt it had on them and their reconnection to democracy. Um, I'm going to hand it over to John now to talk about the impact of the ballot initiative review in, um, as studied by Penn State. Are you ready for this? Just very quickly, um, this slide right here is an example of a survey experiment we conduct. So we send out surveys to voters in Oregon. Some of them get the information in the Citizens Initiative Review Statement. Others get nothing, or they get maybe a, a letter from the Secretary of State, or the summary fiscal impact. The point is that you can see in the chart, reading the statement from fellow citizens had a dramatic effect on people's expected vote on this issue. Um, oh, this is a summary of our research. I, this is me. Um, <laughs> it's me. Um, the bottom line is this, uh, I would say that the, the, the quality of the deliberation on the Citizens Initiative Review panel is very good consistently. The impact on voters is modest, no es muy grande, it's not a big effect, but it is consistent. Consistently voters become, is there one more slide? No. Okay, voters become more knowledgeable about the issue, they have more facts, and they consider alternative arguments a little bit. It is not a huge effect. They don't become completely different people, but there is a consistent impact. So in conclusion, <laughs> um, the, the, the work of Citizen Jury or Many Publics has many applications, and one of which can be uh, very impactful is anything on a binary question or yes or no question. Um, think about um, very large questions, referenda like Brexit, things like that, where many citizens were very confused about um, what, was, what was actual factual information. The competition for the eyes and ears of the voters is intense. Billions of dollars are spent on these ballot questions nationally and statewide and the citizens do not have a fighting chance to figure out what is strong and reliable information. The Citizens Initiative Review is a port in their storm. It gives them strong and reliable information, as we say, by the people and for the people. Um, and with that, we'll hand it over to questions. Eh, entramos en un turno de preguntas. ¿Alguien tiene alguna pregunta? Sí, por ahí. Eh, hola, muchas gracias por la presentación. Soy Jorge Valladares de Lima, Perú. Eh, tengo una pregunta que es más bien técnica y tiene que ver con la metodología de deliberación. Es decir, cómo es que los statements son escritos. ¿no? 
la discusión se transforma en estos dos statements. Vamos a recoger tres preguntas y hacemos un ciclo. ¿Alguien tiene otra pregunta? Bueno, pues entonces pasamos a responder esta. The statements are written in collaboration with all of the panelists based on small group deliberations and a large group vote at the end. There are many iterations of the statement and as you can see it's in three different sections, the key findings which is just the most strong and reliable facts about the ballot initiative that they felt is important for their fellow voters to know. That goes through a series of edits and votes on the part of the panel that um, ultimately those are the facts that were raised to the top of importance. And then the pro and the con statements are also collaboratively developed by the panelists. And the panelists don't get into groups of, yes, we all think that this ballot initiative should, people should vote yes, or we all think they should vote no. They're actually mixed up on purpose, um, randomly, so that the pro and con arguments are developed um, by those who may have natural inclinations, but those who may actually not share that point of view, and really in order to strengthen the argument. In addition to that, um, that's followed by a summary statement on the pro and the, and the con side. This all gets voted on and must be passed by a supermajority, by three quarters of the panel in order to make it into the citizen statement. A, a key feature of the process is, remember, this lasts four days. So the first day is entirely training in deliberation. The second and third days, the advocates and the opponents, the pro and the con, are, are present and get to critique draft statement elements. So the group doesn't go off into a room and deliberate by itself. It's always in a public space and at specific times is getting criticism and feedback. That's very important. Hola, soy Brianda Concejala en Alcalá de Henares. Eh, casi lo ha respondido porque iba a preguntar, eh, bueno, algo que detectamos es que la gente muchas veces no, no tiene costumbre de participar ni de formar parte de grupos de deliberación, eh, ni de cómo llegar a, a consensos o acuerdos. Eh, entonces, ¿cómo o tenéis una sociedad súper eh, entrenada en, en este tipo de procesos o eh, si establecéis una formación o unas pautas y un acompañamiento a, a estas personas? Uh, we're going to collect three questions, okay? Hola, soy Ernesto Ganuza. Quería preguntar dos cosas muy breves. La primera es si todos los referéndums que se hacen en Oregón eh, tienen a un, una, una iniciativa de, de, como esta y, en, y en, si no ese es el caso, cua, eh, ¿cuáles son las razones por las cuales una lo tiene y otra no? En segundo lugar, eh, la iniciativa creo que resuelve un problema muy grande alrededor de los referéndum, eh, no solo en Estados Unidos, sino en el mundo, pero en Estados Unidos hay mucho referéndum. ¿Cuál es el impacto que está teniendo la iniciativa en general en Estados Unidos a la hora de renovar el, este, esta idea de la democracia directa? Gracias. I'd like to hear more about the facilitation of uh, how this process works and how it's supported. Much like the other groups, we have trained moderators, um, in, and by trained, I mean that they are trained for, for a very long period of time in the specific techniques of moderating a, a CIR. Um, we have four moderators for a group of 20 to 24 people, so the ratio is pretty high, and those small groups get taken through um, 
the process in a, in a very meticulous and pre-planned way. And in fact, um, those of you who are in this room who are facilitators, um, th this, is a very, this is a very different process for people who are used to facilitation and, and sort of being able to um, riff a little bit. The CIR is a very regimented process on purpose so that the moderation is pretty strict in, in order to, um, to keep out any bias that the, that the moderators themselves may inadvertently be bringing into the process. These are paid professionals, yes, and, and, and that's a big part of the cost, quite frankly. Aside from the voter support, the, the, the uh, moderation is a big part of the expense as well. Um, in terms of how the citizens are trained to make decisions, I think I heard that was the first question. I mean, that's a big part of the, the first day, is, is this is a very new environment for most of these folks. Um, and what we, you know, what we, what we, um, what we try to, the mantra is stay in learning mode, stay in learning mode. We want you here and you have, a, you have life experiences and you certainly have opinions. What we're asking you to do is widen your field of vision, look up and out and really listen and pay attention to the information that you're hearing in this room, not only from the advocates and the experts, but from one another. So staying in learning mode is, is really repeated frequently um, all four days and you'll often hear the panelists um, remind each other to stay in learning mode throughout the process. So another question was about uh, how do individual issues get chosen in Oregon for using this process? And Oregon is unique. When this law passed first in 2009 and then again in 2011, this was the recession. The state governments had very little money. So they did not fund, and they still do not fund, the Citizens Initiative Review. It's paid for by private contributions. Um, and as a result, the state couldn't, uh, couldn't hold one in 2018. There was no statewide CIR. And on the Estado de Massachusetts, on the other side of the country, in the state of Massachusetts, there is a law being considered to establish this process and pay for it. Um, but even then, um, you need to have, like in Oregon, there is a commission and a majority of that commission is made up of citizens who participated in previous citizens' initiative reviews. So citizens get put by their fellow citizens onto this commission. That commission then looks at the issues on the ballot and chooses the ones that are likely to have the biggest impact, financial impact, legal impact, and those are the issues chosen for the citizens' initiative review. In Massachusetts, it would be very similar but there may not be a limit on the number of reviews that they can do because the state will pay for it. Your other question was about the total impact of referenda and initiatives and whether it's growing. In the United States, you can spend money to get enough signatures to get any question on the ballot. And corporations in particular, but also special interest groups, have been paying more and more to put more and more questions on the ballot. So the problem of voters having very poor information or very little information is only getting worse in the United States because voters are being asked to vote on more and more issues. So I believe that a process like this is likely to expand in the United States. But right now it is only the law in one state in Oregon. That's all. Maybe too soon with Massachusetts. Definitely too soon. It's going to happen. Massachusetts will definitely be probably the first state to put it into law and to fund it at the same time. So we're going in the right direction. Thank you very much.